Hey, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome. Thank you for all. Thank you all for being here. I know it's Friday and it's already like 2 p.m. Who's tired? Who's Who's excited for like even more days? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so glad you're all here. <clears throat> Should we go ahead and get started, or do you want to yeah, wait a minute? Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. <clears throat> so a little introduction. I'm Duffy Cooley. I'm the field CTO at Isovalent. Isovalent is now part of Cisco. We're still doing all the same things we were doing before we were part of Cisco. Nothing's really changed for us. Um, and we're continuing to go to market. So if you ever want to hear more about Cilium, eBPF, Tetragon, any of those things, definitely find the guy in the hat and ask him questions. Uh, my name is Natalia. I'm the product lead for runtime security at Isovalent, which is now part of Cisco. <coughs> so this is our agenda. We're going to kind of introduce a, a few of the ideas, like talking about like what is SecComp, get into some eBPF stuff, maybe do a little demo demonstration of some things. And then we're going to talk about kind of the advantages and disadvantages of each technology. So to get started, I wanted to introduce SecComp. SecComp is, uh, actually stands for Secure Computing. It was introduced in 2005, well before many of the other primitives of containers, right? We didn't really have a lot of the other things that make up a container today. And it was initially helped and introduced to help limit applications that were running on a server in the old style without containers um, <coughs> that share a kernel between each other, right? So like limiting that. And what are they actually limiting? They're limiting things like, you know, any application that opens a file might be, like I need, I need to be, a, I would need a system, system call that's called open at, or if you're opening a socket. But there are a bunch of other system calls in that API that perhaps you wouldn't want that application to be able to have, right? Like shutdown or reboot, or like, you know, some of the more obvious like system calls that don't really, you wouldn't really necessarily want applications that are sharing a Linux kernel to have that kind of control over, uh, over the Linux kernel. It was also one of the first sandbox mechanisms. And from then, we've seen so many more sandboxes, which is a term I absolutely love. Like anybody who's ever seen a sandbox, like why are they call them sandboxes? But, <clears throat> but that idea of basically trying to contain or constrain an application within a, within a specific scope of like what it's able to do against the shared resource has just come a long way. One of the examples is like the browser-based stuff, right? So like WebAssembly, a lot of these things kind of uh, all sort of generated out of things like secure computing, right? Like that, that was the beginning and we've continued to iterate, continued to improve, continued to like create more uh, tools out there that create these sandboxes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So secure computing in practicality, like how it actually works is when you um, start a process and you've defined a SecCom profile, that second profile must be available before the process starts. And when that process starts, and based on that profile, it, it, it represents a one-way change into a secure mode where all of the system calls that that application can make must be within the list that you've provided. Now, there's lots of ways to configure this. You can configure SecComp to actually just warn you or tell you when a particular system call happens, but you can also constrain a given application to a set of system calls. And you can also do co a combination of both of them. Any system call outside of that list, if you're in a more enforced mode, will, will, will resent, will, could result in either recording an event or in killing the, uh, killing the process that tries to make that system call. The other, one of the challenges of, of SecComp, as I mentioned before, is that you kind of need to know ahead of time, like what that list of system calls, like what type of protections you're trying to apply before you start the process. And if you wanted to change that list, you have to like make a new profile with the changed list, stop the process, restart the process against the new set of profile. So this, it's a little, I mean, when you think about like when it was created and like what it was created for, this kind of makes sense. But now we're in this dynamic container age and things are a little bit different. <clears throat> as far as like how we use it inside of Kubernetes or in a cloud native way, there is actually an incredible project that's called the Security Profiles Operator. Definitely worth checking out if you're interested in SecComp, AppArmor, or SE Linux. This, in my mind, is the state of the art for this, right? Because as I said, you have to kind of know, like you have to create a profile, you have to make that profile available on disk, and all of that has to line up before you can even start the application. Because SecComp, when, you, when you're using sec, uh, secure computing, you have to know that before you start the application up. And this means like before Docker run happens, 
All of those pieces have to be in place. And this tool makes that way, way easier. Not only does it make it easier to actually handle the distribution of security profiles, but it also makes it easier to do the discovery of them, to learn like what is normal for your application. All right, so I will talk about like what is ABPF. So I think many of you know like what is ABPF at this point. There has been a lot of talks in this conference around it, so I will just do like a very quick high level introduction. So ABPF allows you to extend the Linux kernel. And um, basically it allows you write some C code or C program, load it into the kernel with some restrictions. Of course it has to be safe, it cannot crash the kernel. It also cannot run forever, right? And then what the C code or C program allows you to do, it allows you to extract information, run some logic, or make decisions. And there are a lot of layers, and at almost everywhere we can actually hook into the kernel, related to, for example, networking, like TCP IP on the socket level, related to, for example, file access using file descriptors, or, for example, at the system call layer. But, and then this part will be actually important for this talk. And then I would like to call out like two really nice advantages here. So this can be done dynamically. So imagine this is very useful if you have like multiple clusters, multiple namespaces, multiple cloud providers. And then basically you can just like flip your BPF program on the fly. Imagine you want to block, for example, a new set of sensitive system calls or you would like to block a new CV. You could actually do this without even uh, rebooting your node, rebooting your, for example, management pod, or even rebooting, for example, your application. So during this like upgrade, everything keeps running, and then the upgrade will be seamless. And then the other nice aspect that it's like minimally invasive. So since you don't need to wake up user space all the time, like it just takes a way more or less CPU and memory. And then, so why is it interesting? Like, what are the answers that, or what are the questions that we can answer with DBPF? So you can ask questions like, okay, what binaries have run in the past or are running now in my system? And then this system can be, for example, Kubernetes nodes, Kubernetes workloads, external VMs, or what version of these like binaries or libraries are running now? Like, are there any, for example, vulnerable OpenSSL versions? or what network connections have been made, for example, from my Kubernetes workload. Like, let's imagine you have like a Kubernetes pod running and that for an hour, and then it just like start to reach out to a malicious S3 bucket. You kind of would like to know that. Or for example, were there any sensitive file accessed um, from that workload? And then, of course, like what system calls have been executed from my workload? Were there any sensitive system calls invoked? Were there any CV exploited, and so on. And then we would like to base this, this solution on Tetragon, which is basically like an eBPF-based runtime security observability and enforcement tool. And then it's actually just an agent, like it runs on, on the top of any Linux operating system. In, in case of Kubernetes, it's actually a daemon set. And then in case of like external VMs, it's a system D managed binary. And then it uses eBPF to extract data from, uh, from many layers. And then you can see it on the pictures. We have visibility into data access, file access. We have visibility into, into Linux namespaces, process capabilities, and then actually it's changes. And then network connectivity, S3, F4 layer on the socket layer, or S7, TLS, HTTP, DNS. And then what's going to be important is actually the process execution and the system call activity. Awesome. Yeah, so in my mind, the Tetragon piece is definitely state of the art for the other side of things, right? So like we talked about SecComp profile operator being a state of the art for SecComp. EBPF, absolutely Tetragon is the state of the art. So I wanted to give a huge shout out to Sasha Gunert and the team that are actually working on this project because it is a, a, a big undertaking. The SBO, does, like I said, does all of the hard work of generating and pushing security profiles to all of the nodes. And, the, and as I mentioned before, the profile must be present on the disk before the container can start. <clears throat> now, this is actually, I thought this was pretty fascinating when I was doing this work, but what I learned when I was kind of looking at the security profile operator is that like, 
you can actually use it to, say, start a container on the pause container, which doesn't make any system calls itself, right? And if you do that, you can see all of the system calls that the given container runtime requires. Now, this is interesting because it means that in SETCOM, right, you have to include the system, the system calls that the container runtime requires, as well as any system calls that your application requires, right? So depending on if you're using C run or run C, like they're actually different sets. I mean, they differ. One, uh, C run uses 65 system calls just for the runtime, and run C uses 78. And some of those system calls seem kind of risky, right? Like some of those things like unshare or being able to change the permissions of a of an, a binary and make it available to anything. Or like it, there are some system calls in that set that uh, could represent risk to allowing you to do container escapes and that sort of stuff. <clears throat> so that was kind of a surprise for me when I was actually digging into this. But yeah, it's it's super interesting that they that they use different sets of uh, of system calls. <clears throat> so. One of the things I like about the EVPF and the SECOM thing is that you don't, it's not one or the other, like you're not required to just use one or the other. You could actually use them both together, right? So if, because of the list of system calls that you must include for the container runtime, if you said, well, okay, it's fine if the container runtime uses them, but I wanna be notified when my application tries to use unshare, right? I wanna be notified when my application does try to make these restricted or, or what I consider to be high risk system calls. I have to allow them because I'm in a container runtime, but that doesn't mean I don't wanna know when they happen, right? And that's where I feel like, that's where the, the two of them together really represent an incredible capability. All right, so I will talk about like, for example, how eBPF and Tetragon could actually like restrict those system calls, like the known bad sensitive um, system calls. So how Tetragon implements like where this identity aware syscall enforcement, while it implements it, implements it via custom resource definition, it's called sandbox policies. And then I will just talk about like how does it work and then what the engineering team needed to implement in the BPF side to work correctly. So we have like three main components here and then I will just start with the first, which is the policy definition itself. So as you can see on the, on the left side or on the right side, these uh, sandbox policies can be namespaced or cluster-wide with pod label selectors. And then it's important to call out that these are like very declarative. So you can, you can actually specify like, okay, this is the namespace that I would like to apply this policy on, or this is the pod that I would like to apply the policy on. And then after that, you can just say like, hey, these are the known bad sensitive system calls that I would like to take some action on. And then after that, you can actually say like, hey, I would like to get an alert, like audit, or I actually want to block those system calls. And then two nice advantages here. One is them that it's actually dynamic. So you can just like modify these policies on the fly. You can just do like kubectl apply. And then you could do that after the pod has started. And then the second advantage is here is that um, it's like very high level. So engineering, the BPF engineers can still innovate and then use um, newer BPF or kernel features. Meanwhile, the user doesn't even have to do anything. It just, they just need to modify this policy. And then this can be like one example alert that you would get like during a sensitive system calling walk. So for example, you could see like, hey, on the sensitive namespace Kubernetes namespace, there was an Nginx pod, and then well, it invoked the sysmount system call and tried to mount like dev SD to the dev SD um, file system from the node to the TMP directory. And then you could see like the capabilities, Linux namespaces, and then the process credentials. So the second part is like the Kubernetes identity of our selectors. And then, so this can be like the namespace policies itself or the pod label filters. And then it's important to note that for observability, the internal filtering is important for like performance reasons. So we can keep the CPU and the memory low, but you can live with the filtering or at least some of the filtering living in user space. But for enforcement, it's important to note that user space filtering is not an option like the filtering has to happen in kernel in line with the operation. 
And then what that means, like those Kubernetes identity aware selectors, like both on the workload side, needs to map to the BPF code. So how we, how we implemented it? Well, we actually map the Kubernetes workloads to C groups. So C groups are a Linux, a Linux mechanism to actually manage and isolate containers. So for example, container runtimes, container, they cryo, they create their own C group like hierarchy. This is just like a very simple example. You can see uh, system D on the top, and then you can see the Kubernetes pods um, under cube pods. And then usually you have like one C group per Kubernetes pod, and then basically one C group per container. So what, what we do on the Tetragon side, it's actually pretty simple. We create a BPF map, and then basically on that map, we assign a unique ID to each policy. And that, that maps another, another map, where we keep actually the C group IDs for the containers uh, to which this policy applies. So whenever you actually apply a new policy, you say like, hey, keep cattle apply, well, Tetragon actually updates or initializes the map. So it looks up actually that like three group um, hierarchy under the three group uh, file system, checks like which Kubernetes workloads match, match, matches to which C group, and then whether, it, whether the policy actually applies to it and then puts it into the map. And then after that, well, Tetragon loads the BPF programs into the kernel and at this point you have the BPF program loaded and then basically they check if the policy applies to that certain process. And then whenever there is like new pods coming or there are like pod label updates, well, we, Tetragon, the Tetragon agent gets a notification from the API server and then it just like keeps updating the map. And then the last piece is, we call it like we use time window or for example, like an advanced configuration. So, it can happen that you, for example, kubectl apply a pod, the Kubernetes API server reaches out to kubelet, kubelet reaches out to the container runtime, and then it starts the container. But it can still happen that this container starts with a policy applied to it, but without the policy actually being loaded. It's because the Tetragon agent didn't get the notification from the Kubernetes API server yet, so it didn't actually have time to set up um, the BPF programs. So as an advanced configuration, what we did, we actually like um, implemented a daemon set. And then what it does is just hooks into the underlying container runtime by using configuring runtime hooks. And then say, whenever there is like a new container starting, then please execute this binary um, from the daemon set. And then what it does, it actually just reaches out to the Tetragon agent. The Tetragon agent basically updates this map and then say it goes back to the daemon set and then it goes back to the container runtime. I say like, hey, the, the policy filter BPF map is set up, the policy is actually configured and then uh, you can actually start that container. And then one minor details, if the Tetragon agent is done, then basically we say, okay, we cannot actually guarantee that the policy is set up and then it will be applied. So please don't start the container. And then of course it's actually like configurable. So you can say like, okay, this namespace is actually trusted. And then, for, or for example, these workloads are trusted. And then uh, those namespaces or those pods can start. So for example, this can be a cube system. So the main services and Tetragon agent are actually able to start. And then after that, I will just like play a quick demo video, which would actually like block sensitive system calls uh, or like bad known system calls or a, on a sensitive Kubernetes namespace. So what I did here is like we used an AWS cluster, 10 nodes, they are running Amazon Linux. Tetragon is running on each node as a daemon set. You will see the Tetragon runtime hooks also as a daemon set. And then I, I configured a sensitive namespace, Kubernetes namespace, and then there will be like an Nginx pod running on it. And then what I will do, I will apply a sensitive syscalls Tetragon sandbox policy. And then what I will do after that, 
I will just like keep cattle exec into the engine export, try to execute some commands, and then which would invoke sensitive system calls, and then you would see that all of those will be blocked. So I will just play the video. So here I'm already connected to the uh, Kubernetes cluster, and then we can actually see that um, on the sensitive namespace, Kubernetes namespace, there is an Nginx pod up and running. And then in the middle, I will actually show the Tetragon Sandbox policy, um, which I will apply to this sensitive namespace, Kubernetes namespace. And then this is going to be um, this YAML. And then what it does is actually pretty simple. It enforces a set of like known bad system calls, for example, sysage root, sysclock set time, syspivot root, sysmount, sysmedvise, um, sysunshare, sysseteness, and so on. And then, in additionally, blocking these system calls, we will get like one event when these system calls are going to be invoked. So I will just apply this um, sensitive syscalls uh, Tetragon sandbox policy on this specific Kubernetes namespace. We can actually see that it was created. And then I will just double check if the policy got installed um, very quickly. And then we can see that um, it, was, it was installed 11 seconds ago and then up and running. And then as a next step on the bottom terminal, I'm actually inside the Tetragon uh, container on the same node where the engine export is running. So I can actually start to observe these like uh, security audit or enforcement JSON event, which will be uh, coming from the engine export. So I will just start to do that. And then as a last step, I will just keep Petal exec into the um, engine export on the top. And then I will execute some commands which would invoke those sensitive system calls. So we can actually see that uh, on, the, on the bottom that the beam bash binary was executed from the Nginx pod. This is one um, runtime execution event. And then as a first command, I will just try to run sage root. And then we can see that the operation was not permitted, which means that the um, syscall enforcement policy was actually working. And then if we go to the bottom, we can actually see the alert as well. So we can see that on the sensitive namespace um, from the Nginx uh, pod, there was a user as being sage root binary, which tried to actually invoke the sage root sensitive system call. And then we can actually see that um, it was enforced. So as a next step, I will either try to execute, for example, mount and then mount the dev sde one file system from the node to the TMP directory on the pod. And then we can actually see um, that it was not successful as well. We got um, permission denied error. And then in the event, we can actually see that um, the sysmod system call was enforced from the user sb mount binary on the Nginx pod. And then as a last step, I can, I can just try to execute, for example, pivot root. And then we will see that the operation failed as well. And then in the alerts, we can actually see the enforcement event the same way as we saw before on from the Nginx pod on the sensitive namespace. Um, the sys pivot root system call was not su successful from the user as being pivot root binary. All right, and then um, as a last step, we will just do a quick comparison um, between the two because both of, both of those technologies has like um, advantages and then disadvantages. So as Duffy mentioned, so on the eBPF side, advantages can be like it's dynamic, right? So the Kubernetes application doesn't need to be restarted for the policy to take effect or the underlying Kubernetes node doesn't need to be rebooted. 
It can be also very flexible. So you mentioned like Kubernetes identity aware metadata, like pod labels, namespaces, but you could do like binaries, hashes, or you could actually filter on like process capabilities, Linux namespaces, Unix credentials. Well, disadvantages can be like, since we are using eBPF, the BTF metadata file needs to be present on the node. And then of course, like new kernel would be needed, for example, for advanced features. So for example, if you want to like multi k support, you might need like a 6.1 kernel to be able to load the policy faster. But on the SACCOM side, so on the second side, some, one of the advantages is that there isn't a window of time between the process starting and the, and the process being protected. Um, however, <coughs> so, and, and there's also really good tooling, like the, like the security operator tooling that I was talking about before, gives you the ability to actually discover what system calls your application is making at runtime. You can create like basically a profile recording and then learn from that profile recording what that list of system calls needs to be to be able to allow your application. And you can actually record that for as long as it takes for you to feel comfortable with the fact that you've made all of the system calls you're gonna make, right? So really good tooling out there. <clears throat> Some of the disadvantages are it's hard to iterate, right? So if you're gonna make a change, if you need to make a change to that policy, that means restarting the application. And that's not something that a lot of people like to do in production. Um, uh, the, you also, and as I mentioned before, you also, have to, you also have to allow for all of the system calls required by the container runtime, not just those for your application, which is a surprise. And that's where, again, I feel like the, the combination of these two really shines, because you can actually, you can, you can allow for the container runtime and then further limit. Um, one of the other pieces to this is SecComp, again, because it was built in a time when there were just applications on servers, it wasn't a container time. It means that when you get events, if you're trying to do learning, or that, that, that profile learning stuff, you're not gonna get all of the metadata that like Tetragon gives you, right? Tetragon for each of those events actually says it was this pod, it was this node, it was this time, et cetera. SecComp is like, it was, this pro it was this PID that tried to make this system call. And you're like, I'll figure that out, yeah. <laughs> All right, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming and I will open up for Q&A. If you're in interested in Tetragon, please go to the Cilium Tetragon repository or join the OSS Slack channel. And actually the engineer who implemented the Kubernetes identity of our selectors are sitting over there. So if you have questions, then you can also ask. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. If you have questions, there's two microphones right in the middle. You first. Hello. So um, is there any plans to add like host-based policies for Tetragon so that you could define like a, you know, for this node group, um, you can have these rules on the host itself. So Kubelet can and cannot do certain things, for example. Yeah, I mean, so you could actually specify like the host with, right? So you could actually match on like host level processes as well. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, for the seccomp profiles, are they host-wide or are they per container to be defined? Yeah, so the seccomp profiles can actually be per container, per process really, right? So if you had multiple containers in a pod, you can define a profile for each of the containers, um, but it is per process the way, the way you should think about it. Do I still need SE Linux or App Armor uh, if I use Tetragon? So they do different things, right? SecComp is more about protecting the kernel. App Armor and SE Linux are more, they, they go a lot farther into protecting a lot of the other shared resources on the host, right? Like the file system access, like whether, you know, like if you look into SE Linux and the container orchestration side of things, it actually cares that the uh, UID of the process running and its permissions as it relates to any file system access that might be on the underlying host. So even mounting a volume in with SE Linux, you have to be very specific about making sure you have the right, um, the right permissions to actually even allow for that. Uh, so they do, di they do different things. I do think that it's a belt and suspenders approach. I don't think it's just one or the other. However, like what's, what's really interesting, I guess to your point, is like when you look at the eBPF capabilities, it is actually much more wide ranging, right? So like if you get into like enforcing these things with Tetragon, you can actually care more about the file system. You can care more about lots more of these things than just seccomp. And I think that's pretty interesting. For um, 
datagram, if I have a cluster with many nodes, let's say 20 nodes, the, how does the policies get updated dynamically? Uh, how easy is that? Do I have to touch each node to get a policy update, or there's a system behind that? I'm having a hard time with you. Can you get a little closer to the microphone? Oh, sorry. sorry. No, I think I understood the question. Oh, okay. okay. So basically, we have like the Tetragon agent, and then we have like an operator, and then the operator actually takes care of the CRD management. So when you say like kubectl apply, like it will get automatically updated on each node, depending where the operator is. So it's a synchronous update. Yeah. Immediate update. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, to do the blocking, uh, you have to do the filtering in the kernel. Yeah. Um, is that a global parameter so that if uh, if I want to do blocking, I have to do all my processing of stuff in the kernel, or is is uh, is stuff still able to go out um, for external processing as well? It's in the kernel, but if you are interested in the BPF detail implementation, I think John and Cornelius can chime in here. It is interesting. I think maybe. Oh, sorry. I think maybe part of your question is like if I write an eBPF program, can I have that filter on like everything that's happening against that against that pattern that I'm watching for? As opposed to can I hook this to specific applications and watch for those applications to make things to do things I don't expect? Is that where you're going? Yeah, granularity there so that um, you can you don't that you can have the best of both worlds where you can still yeah. send stuff out for external processing but then block if you need to inside. Yeah, in that scenario it's a kind of, it, you can do a little bit of both, right? Like you can actually watch for like any system calls we made and you can correlate them based on the events that we're catching for like what's actually watching. But when it comes to enforcement, like you're kind of, you're, you are trying to key that enforcement on specific applications that you're matching, right? But if, you're just, if you just want to be inundated with like, what is everything doing? We can definitely show you that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, well, thank you again. Thank you so much.